at the end. And we're, at the end, we're going to take communion together. And everybody is welcome to take communion. Those that are uh, uh, not sure about it, I'm going to, we're going to explain that at, towards the end. So we love God here, amen? Amen. And we believe that God has a great um, work for us to do, and we're just trying to be obedient, not like Jonah was. And we'll talk about that in just a second, okay? Let's look at um, chapter 1, and we're going to see Jonah. It says, the Lord, that's God, the Lord came to Jonah, uh, and he said to him, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. I'm going to just take a second and pray and ask God to bless the words that I'm going to speak. Father God, we love you this morning. I love you, Lord. And I thank you for everyone that is here this morning. And God, I pray that through the words that uh, you're going to allow me to speak, that our ears would hear what the Holy Spirit wants us to receive. So, Father, we give you permission to rule over this rest of the service. We give you permission, Jesus, to, to rule and reign here. Holy Spirit, guide us. And we just thank you so much for that. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I know when I was a growing, when I was a new Christian, one of the stories I learned was about Jonah and the whale. And it, Tina and I used to be children's pastors, so we would do a little Jonah and whale skits with the kids. And so we would, one, some, one person would be the whale, and then one kid would be Jonah, and they would, the kids would go around them, and they would spew the kid out on the, onto the land. And then Jonah would go and speak to Nineveh, and all the people would get saved or repent. And uh, we, as we find out in the, later in the story, even the king of Nineveh put out a decree and said every person and every animal the king actually took off his kingly robe and put on sackcloth and ashes because he realized by the Holy Spirit that their city and the way he'd been ruling is very, was, was very bad. And so then um, uh, they all repented and turned their hearts to God. And isn't that a great story? <coughs> the whole city changed. I believe in that for Madison, Wisconsin, that the whole city would change. Amen. And they would believe in God and they would believe in Jesus and they would be saved uh, from their sins and they would have eternal life with him. Amen. So look at look at this uh, at verse two. In verse two, it says he went to preach to them. But Jonah, now look at verse three. This is now let me tell you a little bit about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. So he God spoke to Jonah. And he had a relationship with Jonah. So Jonah, God would give Jonah words. Jonah would speak those words to people, and then people would turn their hearts to God. That's what a prophet does. He had a word from God. People would, he had spoke with power. He spoke with the anointing of God. He spoke uh, with revelation from God for people's needs. And when he spoke those words, people changed. Amen? So we need some Jonas today, don't we? So come on and, you know, come power with that. Maybe I have some Jonas out here right now that, that God's going to use you in a mighty way to speak words and you'll see your whole neighborhood come to Jesus or your whole workplace come to Jesus or your whole city or maybe the whole state of Wisconsin uh, come to Jesus. That would be amazing and wonderful. But there's always buts in the Bible. And the word of God says but here. And Jonah had an attitude. How many of you ever get an attitude about God? God wants you to do something. Okay, I have two people that have really <laughs> said yes. We get an attitude towards God, and we don't want to do what God tells us to do. Is that normal? We're human beings. We want to do what we want to do. But God said to Jonah, you need to do something. So it says right here, verse 3, it says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to uh, Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found this ship there and uh, from the coast and uh, at the port. After praying, uh, paying for a fee, he went aboard and sailed the Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, do, do you have that bit, that picture? I want to show this picture and how where Nineveh is and where Tarshish is. Just to give you an idea, it's pretty far away from each other. So Jonah went the opposite direction of Nineveh. And sometimes we find ourselves doing the same thing. I'm going to add those little comments once in a while. Don't feel too guilty, because I believe God wants to take that guilt away today. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, put a smile on your face. God loves you. Oh, yeah. He cares about you. And today's message is for you. Amen? So here it is. There, you can see over here, all the <laughs> way to the, my, your right, is Nineveh. And here, all the way to the left, by Spain, 
is where Tarshish is. That's pretty far away, amen? <laughs> so now when we, I'm going to narrate the rest of the story. So then Jonah got paid for the fee, got on a boat, and as it got out into the Mediterranean Sea, there was a great wind, a great storm came up. And it was so violent that the, the, the sailors on the boat thought they were going to die. And so they went around asking people on the ship, what did you do wrong? What did you, what's wrong? They knew this was a, 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 a God had caused a storm. And so they finally got to Jonah, who was sleeping in the bottom of the boat, taking a nap because he was like, hiding from God. And they questioned Jonah. And Jonah said, the reason this storm's happening because of me, because I'm not listening to God. So this storm was so, anybody ever been on a ship before? You ever been on a ship? You've been on a ship? When you've been on a ship, if you've been in a, I was in a storm in the East China Sea on a big ship, and that, that boat was just rocking like crazy. All of us were sick. It was just, amazing. It was just craziness. And I can imagine this little ship back in that day that they were on was just rocking back and forth and just violently. Uh, they, the, the sailors, the, 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 um, you know, the learned sailors, if you will, the, the professionals were scared too. And they asked Jonah to pray to his God to stop the storm. So Jonah did. He prayed and God stopped the storm. And then they believed in God because they prayed also. Look at verse 12. Jonah told them, just pick me up and throw me into the sea because I disobeyed God. Verse 12. He replied, and it will become calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon us. Instead, the men did their best to roll back to, to land. So they are in this boat, they had oars apparently, so it wasn't that big of a boat, and they're rowing back, trying to roll back to the land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord. Now listen, now these unbelievers <laughs> that didn't know Jesus or know the Lord cried out to the God that Jonah just told them about, right? That's what I think is amazing the story. It says, Oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you. Oh Lord, you have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard because they didn't want to be guilty for killing somebody. You know, they're just being obedient to what Jonah said. And threw him overboard in the in the call and uh, the raging sea became grew calm. Verse 16. At this the man uh, greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made a vow to him. But the Lord provided a great fish for Jonah. Now, I don't know how many whales are in the Mediterranean Sea or anything. I've done any study like that. I guess I could talk to some scientists and ask them. It just says a big fish came and swallowed up Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. I don't know what you would look like after being inside a fish for three days and three nights, but probably wouldn't look very pretty. But anyway, Jonah was inside this whale, or this great fish, as the Word of God says. Uh, I watched Nemo. Was that with Nemo? Finding Nemo? Yeah, and the, the whale came and got him, and they were inside the whale for a while until they got to Australia. Remember that story? So I'm thinking, well, that could be Jonah. Maybe Jonah was in the whale's mouth for three days and uh, three nights, and uh, said he had seaweed on his head and all this stuff, we're going to read this prayer. So that, that's, I just kind of, when I see that, we just watched it the other day with Elizabeth, so I just kind of like thought, yeah, I remember that, maybe that Jonah was in the whale, or the great fish belly for three days, and maybe, uh, you know, God was just kind of taking them back. You know, think about it, they were in the Mediterranean Sea, so they were going to go back to the shore somewhere, and uh, we'll see that in just a minute. But I want to talk about, for a few seconds here, this prayer that Jonah prayed inside the whale. Now, sometimes we get in situations in our life, it could be just like being inside a whale, right? All the, We have trials and tribulations, things are going wrong, we can't figure them out, and sometimes we feel like we're in the whale's belly. Can you say amen? amen. We feel like we're in just this place of desperation, and, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to try God again. God, help me, right? Or finally, we know we should be praying, we know we should be reading our Bible, we know we should be growing close to God, and we got so far away from God, but now at this point, because of our situation, we just cry out, oh God, help me, right? And uh, how many's been there besides myself? And so we all get there, we all do that, and it's fine. And I think God trains us and teaches us, this is a sermon for another time, during those trials and tribulations, to help us and draw us back as a loving father, back to him, so he can help us with our situation. Amen? 
So let's look at this prayer. I'm going to go right through the Bible in chapter 2, and I'm going to just talk about that line by line a little bit, uh, just hoping to challenge you in your spirit about uh, crying out to God. It says, from the inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. He said, in my death... Uh, I am distressed. I call to the Lord. And he answers. So when you're distressful, this is proven throughout the whole Bible. You can call upon God and he's going to answer you. Isn't that cool? Now it's really good if we, we're not distressed, we'll call upon God because he'll answer us then too. But a lot of times we wait until these situations <laughs> happen, right? In my distress, I call to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Have you ever been in an ocean? Uh, we were in an ocean in, in California. There's a different type of beach there. We were in the oceans in North Carolina. And I just love going in the ocean. Matter of fact, we're going to be there in about three weeks. And uh, on the beach, yes, Tina's going, woo -hoo! And uh, we're taking a little vacation down to North Carolina. And you get in the water, the water on the, on the east coast is warm water, and the water on the west coast is cold. I don't know how that, one comes from the south, one comes from the north, or whatever, but it's cold. But we just love being in the beach and being in the ocean. And, but, you know, sometimes the waves will, can break over you, and the waves can catch you, and you start rolling in the water. You ever had that experience? It's just a, it's, you're out of control, and that's the way he was. It's out of control, trouble everywhere, and he was seeking the Lord at that moment. I said, I have uh, been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards the holy temple. And this, was, this is what happens to us, amen, that believe. When we get into those turmoils and the waves of life and things are breaking over us, all of a sudden we turn to God, amen? How many, nobody does that besides me, right? We turn to the Lord at that moment, and then we, 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 we praise Him, we worship Him. It says, you, the engulfed waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I shook. I, sh I stake. I sh I'm sorry. Stake yes. The earth beneath uh, bearing me is forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O oh my Lord. And when trouble or trials or situations in your life get so overwhelmed, we just got to call on God. And he said he would bring us out. Whatever depth or whatever situation we brought us or got ourselves into, he will bring us out of that. Can you say amen? amen. Trust in God. We trust God. He will bring you through all, through, out of every situation. Um, I remember before I was a believer, I was in the process of being a believer. How does that sound? I was in the process of being a believer, and I found myself in a place that was not very nice. I was in the, uh, the brig at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. So I was in jail. I was like in prison. Not like that, but just a, ba a baby prison. And I remember that moment, to this day, it's like it was just yesterday, when I called upon God, I was sitting in the uh, library at the at, in, at the jail, and uh, had injured myself doing on a work working party, and so I couldn't go out of the prison. I had to go. I could do only certain limited things, and so they had let me go to the library. And I, Tina had given me her Bible, so I was took it up to the library, and I was sitting in this very uncomfortable chair, and I was reading the Bible. And I was starting in Genesis, I was already in Exodus, and I was thinking, wow, God, you are like cool. Have you ever read Exodus and Numbers? It really, I mean, God is like showing the children of Israel what to do, how to do it. He's just, he was right there like a dad sharing with his children how to do things. And it just fascinated me because my dad wasn't like that. And so I was kind of like drawn to that more. And I began to read it, and it just drew me to God. And in my desperation, at that moment, I cried out. Now, I didn't yell because I probably got in trouble, but I just cried out, God, I need you. And at that moment when I said that, right when I said that, my, like, I didn't want to be in jail. Come on. I wasn't that bad of a person. I just did some bad things, right? So, I mean, I thought I was, I was good, but, you know, God, you know, God's eye, he showed me that I really was, and I needed to ask him to forgive me. Forgive me. So anyway, I cried out to God at that moment. And when I cried out to God, he just 
overwhelming with his presence, like acceptance. I never felt that before. I never knew that I was, God loved me or cared for me. I grew up in a religious home, if you will. Uh, we were Catholics, and we went to church on Sunday, and well, <coughs> Easter, and, Easter and Christmas mostly, just twice a year, if we, you know, just because Grandma went. And, you know, so we didn't really have any relationship with God, just kind of had this religious activity that we did. And at that moment, I felt this love that overcame me. And God showed me, some of you already heard the story, but God showed me, like, my whole life, like, you know, I was only 19, so, I mean, it wasn't that old, but still he showed me from when I was about 10 or 12, I'm not sure what time, age, all the things that I did, willfully did wrong. Like, you did this, and you opened this, stole this, and, I mean, every time, even when I went to, the, to Johnny's grocery store and stole a candy bar, God was showing me all those things. I was good at it. I could go right in there, right when the cashier was taking my money, I could take a candy bar, put it in my pocket, and he never saw me. I was good. I was good. And God began to show me those little things. My kids just found out like I was a stealer, you know. Uh, but God showed, began to show me all those little things that I, all those sins, all those rejections of His authority, all those things that He, he began to show that. And then all of a sudden, just in a few minutes, and I don't know how much time went by, and it was like God, it was like on a, it's not a whiteboard, because back then we didn't have whiteboard, but it was a chalkboard. It was like all my sins were on this chalkboard, and God took this eraser and just went like this. I just wiped them all away. And at that very moment, as I saw that in my mind's eye, I was free. I was I felt this love that overcame me. It was just amazing. I couldn't I can't even explain to this day how, how much how much that love just sh overshadowed me, if you will. And from that moment on, I didn't care if I was gonna be in jail for a hundred years. I was happy. And I was free from my guilt and my sin, and I knew God loved me. Amen. And then only just three days later, I was out of jail. I will tell you that story some other time. God just miraculously, I was, I was, I was given a pass. I was out, and God blessed me ever since. And so, um, praise the Lord. God, I never understood that. So I want to share it. Let's go to verse number seven. Uh, Evident or away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayers rose to you to your holy temple. That's what I did. I just prayed out to God. And verse 8 is so important. Read the, I went to, When you read the Word of God, how many have a reading schedule that you read every day? I have one right here. I have a little reading chart. So I, have, I read um, this one this year. We're using it um, as a chronological order, so I'm almost caught up to this today on it, and I, I, I do that. But I tell people, don't read the Bible fast. Like, don't do it like, hey, i got to get this, like a homework assignment, like a college course or something, you know. i got to get this done. You know, you're typing away 100. No, you read the Word of God slow because the Holy <laughs> Spirit is a teacher, and he'll teach you the understanding of the Word of God. And I read this next part, section today, uh, this week, and when I read it, the Holy Spirit just went into, I just had revelation of understanding of what God was saying here. Amen? That's what God does to you. When you take your time to spend time with God, He'll show you things that you, I'm telling you, that you just you can't study in books. You can't, you can't, you can, I can study this out. I have, on my computer, I have every type of way to research the Word of God, how, what, how to read Hebrew. I can you know, find the tense, the everything that uh, how the word is written in in in, in the Greek and the ancient Hebrew language. I, I can do all that, but it's when the Holy Spirit gives you revelation, you have understanding of this. Amen. And I can't study that out by myself. It's the Spirit of God. And so when I read this next section, He just showed it to me. I want to share with you here. Look at verse eight. It says, "Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit grace that comes that could be theirs." Let me read it again. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. So God, in, in this moment, Jonah's crying out to God. Maybe he was thinking about Nineveh and all their idols that they, they have in worship. They're man-made idols. They're things that are not, uh, they're just some guy made them and said, okay, this is a God and now we're going to worship that God. And we see that in the Bible everywhere where even the children of Israel were drawn away into worshiping idols. And, and, and we say today, what is idols today? What could be idols today that, that we put before God or worship and that we're missing the very grace of God? So let's say, if you put all your attention, if you're worshiping something besides God, you're missing His grace. So what does that mean? 
It says, we're, if we worship an idol, something that's man-made, something that we put before God, what could that be in America? That could be like our TV set, or our computer, or our car, or our home, or all the things that we have. Or maybe it's a graven image, or an image of something that, uh, uh, from your religion, from your past, from your, from your country, from whatever, your, whatever uh, is part of your culture. And right at this moment, Jonah's saying, you're missing something if you worship a man-made object. Right, Leo? Leo knows now. See, because he has revelation because God touched his heart. See, the, what happened is when you understand we're missing grace. What is it, look at the word. What does it say right there? Look at that. Read that. You got it in your phones or whatever. Underline it. Highlight it in your phone. This, this verse. It says, those who cling to worthless idols... Forfeit the grace that come, could be theirs. What are they forfeiting? They're forfeiting grace. So you have to ask yourself, scholars, right? You have to ask them, what is grace? What am I forfeiting because of my culture or because of my, I, my uh, human desires go to, away from God into things? I'm forfeiting grace. So we have to ask, what is grace? Besides Dion and Ashley's offspring, right? <laughs> Grace is, in the simplest form, if you will, is called unmerited favor. You're getting something from God that you didn't deserve. When I was in that jail cell, I didn't deserve God. I was guilty of what I did wrong. But God came into that room and gave his love to me in spite of what I did. And all I had to do is ask God to forgive me at that moment. And when I said, Lord, I'm sorry... Because I didn't know about forgiveness. I wasn't religious. I, didn't, I just said, hey, God, I'm sorry. And he understood that. Because in my heart, I was sorry. And forgive me for my past. And he wiped it away. That's grace. That's grace. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. And God said, did it for me anyway. Amen? And, and you think, well, how did that happen? How did, gra how did grace enter the world? Grace entered the world through God's love for you and me. Here it was Jonah. God forgave him. And okay, you will read the rest of the story in a minute. And then, and, you know, after Jesus died on the cross, that grace was given to you freely. Jesus was a sacrificial lamb for you and me. His blood was shed that all the sins of the world would be forgiven. Amen. All the desires that turn away from God, everything that ever happens, God freely did that so each one of us could be free. Amen? Free from guilt. I just, uh, if you guys have been here for a while, you know that I, t this is a, I try to say church is a, a guilt-free zone. But how many sometimes you feel guilty coming to church? Come on. You just know it happens. Why? Because we don't feel like we're worthy enough. We can't go to church. But God's arms are so big and is loving, He wants to just draw you into His presence. He doesn't want you to feel guilty about your past because he can take them away just like he did for Jonah right here. He wiped it away immediately. Jonah running away from God, running to Tarshish, right? Going the opposite direction of where he's supposed to go, and God still showed him grace. And you'll see that God used him in just a minute. It says, um, and then after he says this, verse 9, it says, but I, right? Because he didn't deserve this grace either. He says, but I... With a song of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Because he didn't do what God told him to do. Salvation comes from God, right? So when you go to church on Sunday morning, it doesn't really give you a lot of points in heaven, if you will. You, it's not about coming to church. It's not about um, doing good. It's about believing that God is real. That God can do what he said he could do. And you'll see this just in a minute as we go through the rest of the story. It's not about the... Um, um, do, I, I, think, I just think of Madison. You know, Madison is so about doing good. We help uh, puppies and we help homeless people and we have all these things that we do in the city to help people, right? We just do... T there's tons of activities that you can do in Madison and they're all good. Right? I mean, if you help a homeless person get a job or, or give them some food or whatever, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we never share the love of God with them, then we're just doing something to make ourselves feel good. 
Well, I, I felt good because I just helped that person. And it's a good thing. Everybody looks at that and says, everybody in this room can say, was that a good activity? And everybody say, oh yeah, that was a good activity. But then if we don't share God's Father's God's love with them, and that God can forgive their sins, and they don't have to be homeless, and God can get them out of that situation and bring them and set their feet on a solid rock called Jesus Christ, and their life can change, then we're, we kind of do it halfway. All we're doing is satisfying our human desire to feel good. Is that okay? Don't, don't say Pastor Paul preached against doing things. No, I think you should do things and help people. God's gifted you and, and provided for you, and we should do that. But then we have to do the other part of it and say, listen, salvation comes from God. Let me tell you about a Jesus, the Savior, who changed my life, and he can change your life and your situation too. Amen? And that's what the difference is, okay? So let's go on. It says, and, um, verse 10, it says, and the Lord commanded the fish. God talks to fish. Isn't that cool? He created them. Go back to Genesis. He created the fish and the birds and all the animals. So God talked to the fish, and he told the fish. God said to the fish, hey, fish, I want you to go over to the shore, and I want you to vomit out, this is in my Bible, Jonah on the shore. Spit him out on the shore. It must have been that big fish. You know, you ever do us? Uh, never mind. We'll get to that. <laughs> but he spit Jonah out on the shore, right? So where, can you put that map back up? I want to show you. He's... Where did Jonah, so he got spit out on the shore here, and then he had to walk to Nineveh. So what, in this verse, it doesn't show like, well, Jonah got, I don't know if the fish spit him all the way to Nineveh, because that would be a long, that would be a long spit, right? <laughs> I went to church today, and Pastor talked about spitting. So, but anyway, he spewed him out on the shore, I think, and then he had a, had a journey. I think on that journey, something happened in Nineveh. And, and Jonah, he's like, okay, God, I'm going with you. I'm, I want you to be with me. And when he did, he look at the, chapter 3, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. So it's the same word that came to him. He says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And look what it says in verse 3. Jonah, obey. Hallelujah. Okay, I won't preach that. Go ahead. Obey. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And now Nineveh was a very important city. It was a large city, a very uh, prosperous city. A visit required a three days journey. It was a huge city. Uh, three days visit just to get around and walk around it, I guess. And then on the first day, Jonah started uh, into the city. He proclaimed 40 more. This is what Jonah said. So he's at the city gate. All the elders used to hang out at the city gates. All the ruling officials sometimes sit at the gate. He says to them, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned or destroyed. The Ninevites, now listen, all he said, in 40 days, God said, this place is going to be destroyed. And look what happened. Just, just from those short words. Maybe because he wasn't a fish for three days. I don't know. Maybe he... He looks like a ghost. I don't know what he looked like. Bleached out, you know. I don't know what inside of a belly of a fish would be like, but I don't think I want to be there. But anyway, he was there, and he said these words, and then it's this amazing thing that happened to me. I just think God does miracles after miracles, amen? He wants to change your life, and he wants to change your life. And the whole city repents, the king repents. It's, it puts, they put on sackcloth and ashes and ask God for forgiveness. And what did God do? God saved the city of Nineveh. Amazing story. Amen? Amazing story. God wants to save your city and your country and your life. Amen? God wants to save you. And he wants, he wants to tell you today, change, change. Amen? Christian, you believers, you need to change. And serve the Lord. Amen. Those that are new or learning about God, we need to change and know who He is. Amen. And they, they you can read the rest of the story, and it says they changed. Even the animals, they had the, the, all the animals even got sackcloth put on them. He wanted the animals to be saved. He wanted the, all the people to be saved, and they I, and they were they were saved. Amen. And God, they turned from their evil ways. It says, and they became compassionate people. So let me tell you how Nineveh really was. How evil was Nineveh? When they captured people, 
the Ninevites, the army, would take the ruler of that area that they captured and take these large fish hooks and they put them through their mouths or through their, their jaws and they would pull them through town. That's what they did. They were horrible people. They were, they were, they were God, but God, I want to tell you about Nineveh. They were so horrible and so wicked, but what does it say? God saw the wickedness and he wanted to change them. So, as a father, think about this. He looked at them as his children. Even though they were so wicked, his love still extended to them. Amen? And in, in Jonah, if you read the rest of the story, Jonah was mad at God because God saved Nineveh, if you read chapter 4. It's like, how can you do that? He, went, he wanted to destroy it because they were wicked people, but God didn't see that situation, or didn't see uh, Nineveh, as a wicked city, he saw them as lost, hopeless people, and he wanted to extend his grace to them. Amen? I want, this, is, this is a message I want you to get today. We're all in Nineveh. We all see things as Nineveh. They're wicked situations, they're horrible situations, but God wants to extend grace to that situation. Amen? If you're called in ministry and you think of, you're thinking about things, and you say, well, this is just a hard... I hear so many people tell me, Pastor Bob, this is such a hard city, man. It's so hard. People don't love God in Madison. I see. And I think of this story right here. I think, that, well, God can look on Madison with love and grace. And we can't see it because we just see the hardness and the sin. And we concentrate on those things. But we don't concentrate on the love that God has for Madison, Wisconsin. Or for our own lives at that point. Well, how can God love me? I'm just the way I am. Well, God can love you because he does. Even, the Bible tells us, even from the foundations of the world, before he even created earth as we see it now, I do believe in the Big Bang Theory. God spoke it and it happened. Amen? I believe it. Scientists are right. I don't, you know, everything they try to say against God is, I said, how can you even say that? It's like you're really, you're proving God is real. So that's why I love getting some arguments sometimes. Not a lot, but I just think, you're just proving God. Well, this happened, and this was created, and I, they find this bone, and they say this is the way it happened. Yeah, that's great. God did that. Amen? God did that. Amen. I love that. I said, prove, go ahead and say something. Well, the stars are this way, and they form this way, and they do this. Yeah, because God put them in the Word of God. So he placed them there, the stars in the heavens, so we can know Jesus. So you get away from astro astrology and go to astronomy and actually read uh, what all those stars mean. It tells the story of the birth of Jesus, Jesus' life, and tells about his return. The, the, the constellation, they call it um, the lion, right? The loop, uh, Leo, the lion, right? They call it Leo. But Leo, you got to go, got a constellation after you, brother. That star is the, represents the Lion of Judah. And when it's in a certain place at a certain time, we know that this is when God's return is coming. It's just amazing. Everything points to Jesus. Because God, it says, all nations will come to him and worship him. All people groups across the world will be bowing our knees towards the, Jesus and worshiping and loving him and, caring and, and saying, I will be like the angels. We'll join the angels. They'll probably be on key, and I won't be, but I'll be singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Think about this. It says all throughout the word, many times, it says heaven and earth are full of God's glory. He says in John 17, uh, 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 17 21, it says that, that when we love each other, Jesus prayed this prayer for us. When we love each other and care for us, we show the glory of God. Amen. Why don't people come to Jesus? Because the Christians and the believers don't love each other. Come on. We're prejudiced. We, we, we say things we shouldn't say. I'm just trying to warn you right now. It's time to stop doing those things and show God's love. And so somebody might speak differently than you do, or dress differently than you do, or maybe they don't believe quite the way you do in the Bible. It doesn't matter. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then we need to love each other. And we need to show that love. And that way, it says that in that way, the world will know Him. All those that are not Christians, all those that are struggling and don't understand the Word of God, all those that don't have a relationship with God, they will come to know Jesus because of our love one for another. 
So Christians, I'm just talking to Christians now, believe it. Stop talking about each other. Stop backbiting. If somebody's wronged you, the Word of God says this. Go and ask for forgiveness. Amen? If somebody did something bad to you, then you need to go confront that person and say, please forgive me. And in that, you're showing the love of God. Well, Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. Listen, stuff, people's done stuff to us all the time. We all go through stuff. Some of us go through some horrible things. But the Lord God says this, you must forgive. If you're a believer, you must forgive. So your Father in Heaven can forgive you. Amen? That's hard. I know that's a hard word. I say it a lot here because I just want people to understand well, us as believers have a responsibility to carry the, the love of God to the world around us. Not religion. Not, not a religious activity because that just go, tears away from God because it becomes, I have to do it this way. No, it's the love, the genuine love. That's why the Word of God, uh, Paul tells Timothy, practice hospitality as a young preacher. Practice the gift of hospitality. Well, what does that mean? That means open up your doors, have a meal together, share, share your life with other people so they can know me, Jesus. Not me, but Jesus. Right? I mean, there's so many great conversations happen over meals, right? Or during, during activities and things like that. It's been spending life together so we can see Jesus be glorified. Jonah came to Nineveh. And Jonah said to Nineveh, you guys are really bad, and if you don't change, in 40 days, God's going to destroy your city. And immediately, because of that warning, they changed. I want to warn you today, you've got to change. I want to share with you a scripture verse that most of you probably know, and I'm going to, kind of, I'm going to close with this, and then we're going to share communion. I want you to turn to chapter 3 of the book of John. And the story about Nicodemus asking about this thing about being born again. Because Nicodemus was a Jewish uh, scholar, and he saw the many things that Jesus did while he was on earth before he, he suffered on the cross. And I mean, he healed leopards. I mean, leprosy. I mean, I mean no, it's just a horrible disease. Your skin falls off. It's horrible. And there's still some pockets of that in the world, but most of that's been uh, eliminated uh, now. But the, back then, they didn't have the doctors and the medicine and things that we have today. Maybe that's why our faith is so weak, because we rely on a doctor more than we rely on Jesus. Amen? I'm included. I'm just, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I run to the doctor, I got this pain. Here, take these pills. You're good to go. Instead of crying out to God, saying, God, help me. Help me, Lord. I need to be healed. And, uh, and he began to talk to us. Let's look at this, uh, verse chapter 3. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus that night and said, Rabbi, which is really cool because when he's honored, he said, Rabbi, because he, uh, he looked at he knew he was a teacher. The word rabbi means teacher. He said, We know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miracle signs you are doing if God were not with him. So God, he recognized all these wonderful signs and, and all these miracles that Jesus was doing around Jerusalem and around that area. And he just, hey, you know, God, God's got to be in you. Something's different about you. How do you do those things? And then Jesus replies to him immediately. He goes right to the issue. God does that to us. He goes right to the issue of the problem. What you're seeking is this. And this is what Jesus said. He said, and Jesus replied, and said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Now right there, he was saying, listen, you scholar, I know you know the old covenant. I know you know about sacrificing animals for the forgiveness of sin, but I'm going to tell you a new covenant. I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen that's, that's, that takes all the religious activity away. This is to the point right here. You must... It says, uh, you, it says, okay, let's go on. Verse 4, and how can a man be born when he was old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time in his mother's womb. Now here's a, here's a scholar, right? Knows the Torah, knows the Old Testament, if you will. Understands the law. And he, I mean, he's a really intelligent individual. He's, he's asking Jesus, I mean, how can I go back into my mom? What do you mean it's born again thing? I mean, it, it just can't happen. Especially because now I'm a man. 
It's impossible. So he didn't understand it. And I think it's great because he, in his mind, Jesus just blew his mind right there. He's like, listen, you've got to do this. And, and in, his, in his intelligence, he's trying to figure this out. <laughs> what are you talking about? And he asks him this silly question. Then Jesus gets to the point. He says, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water, which is your natural birth, and the spirit. So now he enters it. Now he says, okay, you have to be born. Nicodemus, good, you had that point. You got that part. But now I want to tell you the other part. You have to be born of your spirit. It says, um, verse 6, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or whether it goes. So it is with someone who's born of the spirit. So we say, when uh, Leo gave his life to Jesus, he said, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. What he just said, though, that he believed Jesus, and all of a sudden something happened in his spirit. It wasn't, how did that happen? I don't know. I'm different right at that moment when I was in that jail cell. At that moment, something changed in me. My spirit became alive. I accepted God, and all of a sudden, something changed in me. But I was sitting in that jail cell. I was happy. I mean, <laughs> Tina was in one outside in Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina. I was in the jail, but I was happy. How, how can that happen? Something changed in me. I couldn't explain it. I didn't have enough teaching. I didn't know the Bible. I just knew that something changed in me because I believed that God took my sins away. That's being born again. Amen. My spirit became alive. And I believed for the first time. Oh, I was so excited. Amen. You should, God says in book for you us uh, religious people. The book of Revelation says this. That we must return to our first love. We must return. We need, we need to quit serving the things that we do in our life. Let's go back to when that joy happened when you first believed. And understand that God loves you. Sometimes we get this, this Christianity thing is, is a hard battle. Paul says it's like running a race. We have to work at this because the enemy of our soul wants to steal the joy and steal the hope from us. And so the battle, we have to constantly uh, refresh our spirits. That's why God wants us to draw close to him as a father with his children draws close to each other. And the joy and the love is showing there at that moment. It's just an amazing thing. And so God is saying, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here, you have to be born of your spirit. I can't tell you how that happens. It's like the wind blows. You don't know where it comes from. But at that moment when you believe, something changes in you. Amen? Uh, put some smiles on your face. Come on. This, this is good news. This will change your life forever. It's not easy. We got, and I say it's not easy. I don't know, you know, somebody walked through the door. I won't say that. But I'm just saying there's Christians all over the world that are being persecuted because of this right here. Right? They believe in Jesus. So it's an important thing. It is a work and everything's against us. But you know, God, our reward is great. First of all, you can, how, isn't it way nice just to be happy even though your world's falling around, around you? Huh? Every, the finances aren't there. This ain't happening. The car broke down. The water heater isn't working. All these problems happen in your life, but there's some joy and peace because of your relationship with Jesus. Man, that goes a long way. You know, it goes a long way. I mean, I just, you just to be happy. Tina and I have been praying. Um, these last three days, we have a group of uh, uh, prayer warriors, intercessors, that, are, that went to Washington, D.C. to pray over all the different, uh, the education system, all the uh, consulates, uh, over the White House, over all these. We've got strategic prayer people that went there. I can tell you that now because they're coming back today. Uh, for the last three days, they were there praying for, for our country. And we have spent some extra time in the evening praying. I tell you, it's just somebody, turn off the TV at 9 o'clock, put on some worship music, get the scriptures out, and pray. I'm telling you, the, it changes your life. It changes the atmosphere of my home. It will change the atmosphere in your, in your home also. Just spending time with God. And it's because our spirit is now connected with God's spirit. And there's just happiness and peace and God's presence there. Amen. I love it. 
I love it. When my world's all messed up and I can't, I'm confused, I don't know what to do, I get on my face and I pray and God's presence shows up and I go, like, okay, my problems would go away. I still have them. I have to deal with them. But I can do it with a smile on my face and say, okay, let's go. We're going to overcome this situation. It's okay. God's with me. Amen? Uh, and as we said on Nicodemus, look at the, that verse 9. It says, now how can that be, Nicodemus says, you are Israel, uh, Israel's teacher, uh, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen, but still people do not accept our testimony. God said, look at that, that, that guy over there that was a leper, he's healed. The guy that had crippled uh, legs, and, and, I, and I prayed for him, and, and he came alive. That God's real. That's what he's telling Nicodemus. Look at all the testimonies that you see around you, and you still don't believe. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one can ever, uh, ever has ever gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven. That's Jesus himself, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, now you have to go back and, and look at that, when the, when the people were uh, disobeying God, he lifted up this this serpent on uh, the snake figure on a pole. When people looked at that, then those snakes stopped biting them and they left the children of They did that because, and the story tells you that they were disobedient to God, and that's why he did that. But Jesus was lifted up. We're not going to get bit by all these things anymore. Just look towards the cross. Look towards Jesus. And all those snakes and all the trials and tribulations, all the stuff in your life, I, I don't, well, really what it means, all the sin in your life, God will take away. Just look toward him. Just look towards Jesus and all those things will go away. Anybody receiving this today? Amen. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so that the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. So what does it say for you to have eternal life? What does it say right here? This is the key to the gospel. See, the religious people will say, well, you have to come to church on Sunday, and you have to give an offering, and you have to be a good person, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and then you're, then you're okay. That's religion. The Word of God says here simply that you must believe in Him. All those other things help us on our journey. They're not bad things. They help us on our journey. But right now, we, you know, we just like, oh man, that's, all, that's too much for me to do. What is God requiring you to be saved? To go to have eternal life. What is God requiring you to do? Right here it tells you very simply, if you just believe. Amen? Everything else is religion. Everything else is religion. Parents, talk to myself. What are you requiring your kids to do? You have to be good. You have to clean your room. You have to do this. Blah, blah, blah. And we tell them, God's going to get you. Don't stop doing that. It's not about that. Because they have to believe in God just like you do. But it does tell the children, if you obey your parents, you live a long time. So that's cool. I love that part, too. I just, you know, when my kids get grumpy at me, I say, hey, you know, uh, you want to live long? The Word of God says you have to obey me, so that's good. But anyway, God has a sense of humor, too. Amen? I mean, I mean he's a loving Father that cares for you, and he, he wants to have fun with you. Matter of fact, the Word of God tells us that he made us for his pleasure. He's not a big bad king up there telling what to do wrong. So that's why we have a bad perspective. We can't have a human, like he told Dick D. We can't have a human uh, way of looking at God. We have to look at it in our spirit as the loving Father brought his son to die for our sins so we can have a relationship with him again. And verse 16, most of you know this, and I'm going to stop with verse 17. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And this is a verse, I always share this verse when I read verse 16 because people just end there, but look at verse 17 in your, your cell phones or whatever you're using. It says, For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. And that's what we think of God sometimes, that he's there to condemn us. We did this wrong, and also he's going to beat us up. He's going to throw us into hell. God never created hell for you and me. He created hell for uh, angels that disobeyed him, and that's another story for another time. But he never intended for you. He intended for us, human beings, all nations, every people group, that when we believe that we'd have a relationship with him, and then we'll, have a we'll spend eternity with him. 
We don't have to walk around with guilt and sin. He wasn't taking that away. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to give them the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what God did for us. He wanted to save us. He wanted to deliver us. He wanted to set us free from sin and guilt. He wanted you to know that he, that he loves you. Amen. That's why I love, and that's one thing I love about Madison, because when we came to Madison, we our heart's always been uh, working with the international community. When we were we were in the military, so we were in the East Coast and the West Coast, and we, we had always went to churches that, that was all people groups that could come and worship together. All people groups could study together. All people groups could learn, because I could, we learned so much from each other. And that God, I think the message sometimes is, I don't know if you're from, I mean, we spend time in Japan, they have a whole other belief system. We, we know people from China, they have another belief system, religious-wise. You know, in India now, I'm learning more and more about the millions of gods they have in India. You know, everything's a god there, you know? It's just craziness. It's like a frog is a god. I mean, come on. It's a frog. God created it. Not to worship it, to eat it, you know? I mean, food. But people do that, or people make images out of out of things. You know, we had this big Buddha uh, statue at one of the places. You know, a big tummy thing. I'm thinking people rub the tummy for good luck and all that. So I'm like, come on, really? You know how silly that is. I mean, it's a piece of wood. It looks cool. I mean, some of them are very ornate when they do them. But I just think this is not a god. Or people worship things like even even crosses. Sometimes they just it's got to be. Is it more about the object than it is the person, Jesus? What the one on that? Let's do this today. Let's close. I'm going to have uh, Rajiv and, and uh, Angel come. We're going to serve communion to you guys. And the Bible tells us if we serve communion that. We got to be careful that we we don't take communion unless we uh, have a relationship with the Lord. And every you don't have to be a member of Capital City Church to take communion, but we ask that you have a relationship with Jesus. And so before we do that, I just want to ask everybody: Would you just bow your heads for a second? I haven't done this in a long time, but would you bow your heads out of respect for God and for each other? I want to challenge you today. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. I don't know. If, you know, you're running away from God, you're heading to Tarshish, or you're doing, being obedient to God, and you're, you're going to Nineveh. I don't know if you're like Nicodemus, questioning who God is and how things should work, but God loves you this morning, and He cares about you. And if you want to take a step of receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you raise your hand and put it right back down? We want to pray for you. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Take your hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.